Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chabarim. Shalom. If you watch the video regarding um, our first black uh, rabbi, <laughs> right, of the resurrection, let's put it into context. We had other rabbanim in ancient days and times, right, when we know the truth, right? So we had, it ended off when we were speaking about the flag, right? I'm about to say, like, whose flag is it? We were speaking about this treaty between the lion of Judah, my treaty between the king of Ethiopia and the United States, His Majesty Minulik II, Dagmawi Minulik, Negusa Negesa Ethiopia, King of Kings of Ethiopia, or in the translation, they would say emperor, but literally in our language, the King of Kings, bringing out the essence of reality and prophecy to regulate commercial relations between the two countries. And we was touching on the date of this. Right, because we had showed in another video from another channel and site, we had showed actually this flag also with I think it was Mordecai, Rabbi Mordecai Herman, if we're correct, Rabbi Mordecai Herman, and Rabbi Rabbi Mordecai Herman, Mordecai, very interesting Esther, right, Hester, Astia, our Hebrew Ishtar, Esther, right, with Mordecai. Anyway, um, in that picture. It's a historical picture. Let's see if we can just show this right here because here we're going to segue to the first part of the vlog, the vid. We sought to just emphasize the 145th, if our math is correct, anniversary, right, of the birth of our first, right, our first, you could say, rabbi, you know, scholar, sage, right, a sage, very important man, Josiah. And I would like to connect to Josiah. Keep in mind his uh, middle name for the J for Yo Josiah or Josiah. Do you know what do you know about Josiah? And it's interesting that right now in this 2022 year, on this Shabbat coming forward, right, the 23rd of April 2022, a Shabbat day, and actually the eighth day, especially for us in the diaspora over here in the West, the Beta Israel of the West, that it's the eighth day, we say, of Pesach for those in the diaspora. And it's a Shabbat day, and it's also the Earth Day, or we could say the birthday of Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford, 1877. So just doing that math again, 145 years. Yes, 145 years. So some more on Josiah. Stay tuned for Josiah. What about Josiah? Who is Josiah? What's the significance of his name, right, being Josiah, right? And it appears that this was his given name, right? We could do a little more research to find out whether it was, like says, a good name is rather to be chosen right? Rather than silver and gold and all that, right? Whether it was his given name by birth, right? Or whether it was a chosen name, the name does fit, right? The name definitely does fit. As you can see, we did a lot of research here, you know, but let's just focus right here. Here we go. You see in the background, you see the flag in the background, right? You see the American flag on one side, and then you see what looks like right? The state of Israel flag today. Now, if you do any research on the state of Israel, I think there's a Wikipedia page that talks about when um, the European, the Eastern European Jews who basically um, were in the, um, I can't even say, they basically were, were all over that, basically, you know, because the state of things in the world, you know, as they be, you know, in these latter days and time, and they were not decided on what flag they was going to use. And there was many different ideas. I think it went on for about 20 something years. This flag is going over a period of 20 to maybe 40 or so years. Even some of the ones that seem to appear before we see this picture here. This picture here, right? Just zoom out right here. This picture here is, I think, 1928-29. And you see Rabbi Mordecai, right? Herman right there, if I'm correct. Right. And some other of the elders and the brothers, as well, some sisters and the babes as well. And the youth. Right. So here, 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 you see right here in 1920, in late 1920s, this is 2829. Right. You get to see that there is the Israelite. Let's call that the Israelite flag. Right. Amongst the Beta Israel 
of the West in the diaspora here in the Americas and the Caribbean under the 400 year, right? Under that 400 year prophecy, right? Also, right? Um, rising up from the consequences, right? We had to do a bid, 400 year at least bid, right? Rising up for the consequence of disobedience, reclaiming their heritage, right? And our collective heritage, right? Now, this order basically after the 30s would become known as the Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews and also the Commandment Keepers Congregation of the Living God or Elohim Chaim HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem So here, here, here this is another picture right here you can see this a little better yeah, this is much clearer as you can see this picture is very much clearer right, it has a lot of the good gradations right here it's a very much clearer picture you can see Everyone clearer, what's going on right here, who's who in the picture, right? Who's who in the picture right here? And this is the Moorish, right? Under the name at that time, the Moorish Zionist Temple of Moorish Jews. Now, a lot of people would ask about that. Well, how do they go from Moorish to Ethiopian? Have you ever read um, J.A. Rogers? J.A. Rogers, you know about J.A. Rogers? A couple of good books that I would recommend. One is, I think, Nature... Knows no color line. Very interesting book because it'll show our the Israelite, right? The Black Hebrew, the the we say the Beta Israel, the Ethiopian Hebrew presence in Europe, right? In Europe, this is where the essence of the coat of arms. A lot of people point to the coat of arms and talk about Moor, the name Moor and Moorish, and talk about maybe Ethiopia or Negro and Black, but they don't really seem to have a good historical context. They might be speaking some truths, but a lot of it is not in order. It's out of order. That book would help ones and ones to put things in order. And prior to, right, you know, them choosing the Ethiopian name, to be called the Ethiopian Hebrews and recognize themselves as the royal order. The best of the information of our scholars, such as J.A. Rogers and others, had pointed out the history of what we were called by foreigners. It's like the term Hebrews. In fact, the Hebrews didn't really refer to themselves as Hebrews in that sense. Because the Hebrew bespeaks of the spirituality, like Abraham. He crossed over. He crossed over, he came out of the land of his nativity, and he went forward to that promised land of Yahweh, Hashem, right? And he also crossed over, right, from low degrees to high degrees, you know, from the, the worship of the Elohim Acharim, uh, the Elohim who are no Elohim, other Elohims, to Ha-Elohim, to Ha-Elohim. To the power, the true good, the true God. So in that sense is the real meaning of Hebrew. So we say that Hebrew applies truly to the spirituality, the psycho spirituality, right? More so. It's a qualification that when it says that many, um, not all who are of Israel are Israel. Right? The true Israel, the spiritual Israel, is a real Hebrew Israel. That means they are Hebrew in spirit and in truth, right? So, others, if you read the scripts, it's like the Philistines when they had stolen the ark and everything, they basically, you know, were saying the Hebrews, the Hebrews, they called us the Hebrews, right? Because that's how they referred. We refer to ourselves as Israel, as Beta Israel, as B'nai Yisrael, right? But the Moorish title or the Moorish identification, let me put it simply, the oldest identification of, we could say, melanated black peoples. And when we say black peoples, we put an S on that, all right? You know, like the ancient Egyptians, they were black peoples. And the Hebrews, they were black peoples. Now, some of them had similar complexions. Some of them had different complexions. We know this among black people even today. We also know that black people have all different types of phenotypes. And this is a part from white supremacy, white racism. This is a part from, we say, the incursion of the white man. In fact, right, the white man, so to speak, right, based on genetics, would appear to have come out of the black gene originally as the recessive genes come out of the dominant genes. And we find within the white man's general DNA, right, a trace and a root Right, to the black gene. The only thing different between the genetics that the geneticists have stated is that in, in white 
and and in some Asian, right, there is some Neanderthal gene, and this is not found amongst black people, especially those who, you know, we say like those east of the river now, you know, the indigenous peoples who have stayed in these regions of the world, right, for thousands of years, you know, like everywhere in Africa was basically all, the continent was affected, right, by the white man's, the European, we could say Esau or Edom in the prophetic sense, by his doings, by the works of his hands, right, except for say Ethiopia and other places. We identify that as because of this divine heritage, right? Because of this Judeo, we could say messianic Judeo-Christian covenant because of the roots there. Why? Because the almighty sought to fulfill his word. Mm -hmm. He said that from the seed of Dawi upon the throne right, of King David, and then later on the throne of King David is identified Right within the scriptures as the throne of Yahweh, of Yahuwah, of Jehovah, of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Baruch Hashem. In other words, the throne of the Lord. You'll find that in KJV as that the throne of that Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, sat on the throne of Jehovah. So how Dawit, David's throne, even in the Brit Hayashana, what's called the Old Testament or the Tanakh, as some of y'all refer to it, that, that acronym there, right? you'll find that the throne of David, of Dawi, is now referred to as the throne of Jehovah, the throne of the Lord, the throne of Yahweh. Now, how, how is this so? How is this so? How can the throne of David, because of the words of Yahweh, his words, what were his words? His words was that he... Right, basically, he is king forever, and he will sit upon that throne in the fulfillment. This is what links the true Brit Hadasha, right, or New Testament. We say theology and prophecy with the roots of the Brit Hayashana with Torah, right, and with the prophets, or as ones might say, with the Old Testament. But as you can see clearly here, you can see this flag in a picture that you can follow up on this picture. I think it's Chester. Chester Higgins, the hill up Chester Higgins. If we're correct, if it's Chester Higgins, it might be another photographer. We'll look at that, you know, but um, I'd like to heal up those who have done this work, you know what I mean? And hopefully give ones their flowers, as they say, while they can smell it, you know what I mean? You know, to give thanks for the, for the scholarship, the work, for the art and fact, because these are very important points of reference. So you can see the flag here. This is 19 what? This is 19... 2829, right? This picture here, right? This is pre-1930, because this community, as we mentioned, the Moorish Zionist temple of Moorish Jews, they would, in a sense, continue to grow. They, they get to the root when they call themselves and identify themselves as Ethiopian Hebrews. They're getting to the prophetic root. Are ye not as the children of Israel unto me, O children of the Ethiopians, or B'nai Kushin. Now, I know some of the One Westers and others, they have a different interpretation. It's interesting, their interpretation or misinterpretation of that word there reminds me of what some of the Eastern European Jews, who they call Edomites, how, how some of their Rebbenite, right? Some of their rabbis, Latter-day rabbis and others, how they would misinterpret that verse as well. The verse from Amos, Amos 9 and 7, right? But we can touch on that the book by J.A. Rogers, um, Nature Knows No Color Line. And there's a, I think there's another document, too. There's also the real facts about Ethiopia as well. But that book there, he goes into the historical um, references by like the Greeks, right? The latter-day Greeks, because the early Greeks were black and brown people. But the latter-day Greeks, right, they referred to the melanated people to the south as Ethiopians, generally speaking, as Ethiopians, that terminology, Ethiopians, right? Before this pseudonym of so-called Africans, right? And that root there of Ethiopia originates, right, in the Gutas and in the Afro-Semitic languages, firstly. But most people only know it because of the Greek, the Greek rewrite and the Greek popularization because the world that we live in is a Greco-Roman system. So they can't get beyond the system. But when you get 
past the system right and get out of the box so to speak you'll recognize you'll see the real roots how tobia tob tob tawab means good and ya ya he who be cha so tobi ya right to say that in simple terms god is good or he who be or cha is good or the good cha right so tobia but that's the first original. Then when the Romans came in after the Greeks, the Romans continued from the Greeks. We can say this is the embryo, the seed of the rise of white supremacy. Not so much as it became later on, but this is where it, in other words, emanates from, so to speak. Right. Then we have the term Negro. So the Romans use the term Negro. This is why even in the New Testament, we have Simon of Serene and one who's called Niger. Right? I think he's one of the ones who's called Nigger. Well, actually Niger. I think it's N-I-G-E-R. So they tell us that's Niger. If it was two G's. It'd be the, you know, the other by word. Right. So to speak. This makes me ask a question about Nigeria. You know, like well, what's the connection there? Just putting that out there. But that's where the Negro terminology to identify black people comes from. Right. From the Western Gentile European. Right. Then later on. Right. What's interesting is that the term Ethiopia was still being used even sometime more so than the term Negro, but in different where the white man was kind of taking over in a sense where the black monarchy and black nobility had ruled. This is why we had those coat of arms throughout Europe. So J.A. Rogers book actually fills in a lot of the gaps that a lot of these memes that you see and a lot of folks that be doing some memes, some true, some not so true, some kind of true, a little true, a little false and everything like that to get the full of full of that. But at this point, we get to the Moorish term. The name Moor was referred to as black people after like El Cid, after the time of um, what Reconquista or something like that, like reconquering Spain and El Cid. Some of you know there was that movie El Cid. And after they, the Europeans basically had drove out, you could say when the Moors, they ruled for what, 700, 800 something years, whatever, you know, and Othello tells you, Shakespeare's Othello tells you, they got watered down and they got their nose open. <laughs> they got their nose open and they got watered down. And that black presence gradually, you know, became more mulatto and gradually became more white. And thus we get the rise of the white European monarchies. This explains a lot of what later on would happen, right? In white supremacy, racism, you know, um, the pseudonym of Africa, dividing Africa and black people and the Hebrews and all the other racist things, racialism, white supremacy. This explains it, right? It's almost like something happened before that many Europeans don't talk about. Because when you look at white people's slavery and enslavement of black people, even when you look at what the Bible says would happen, right? It does prophesy that this would happen. But it also shows us that the motivation of so-called white supremacy and racism. Not all white folks, but many white folks just went along with it because it's like that old saying, better them than, than, than me, right? Um, the motivation seems to be um, malice of forethought. You know, like malice of forethought, like, you know, like a crime. If somebody in the Torah, there's, there was a whole good reasoning that some of the brothers had on the Moshia and the high priests and the refuge cities. But it's like... Um, some two men are in the field and they're chopping wood and the axe head from one axe goes and strikes the other man in the head. It's an accident, right? But the family of the dead man don't know it's an accident and there's the principle of the blood avenger. You know, like in the in the heat of passion, you hear about somebody said, oh, your loved one is dead and, and I accidentally did something. And, you know, the heat of passion might make a person want to kill that particular person right there. The point of this is that if there was malice of forethought, if there was malice before, right, or if there was hatred, or if one had expressed hatred of the other, especially the living man expressed some hatred of the dead man, it would be charged that there was murder. If there was hatred already expressed or ill will, which tells us a lot about the morality or the esprit de corps, the spirit of the community. You know, like 
a lot of the Western, they like jokes, you know, people be joking and doing a lot of kind of crazy stuff. And then they be say, oh, I was just joking. You know, when you become offended, oh, I'm, I'm, I was just joking. It's, you don't play like that. Like people say, you don't play like that. I point that out because just to kind of connect the dots here, that what the Europeans did, right, in racism and white supremacy, there was a motivation. There's something, there's some reason why they went calm. They went ham. Right? against the black man, woman, and child. There's some reason. And we submit that one of the reasons is the fact that black people had ruled Europe. And this is one of the kind of things that is known from the facts and the evidence. You'll find all these facts. And one time they used to be able to excuse it. Back in my early days before the social media, you can excuse it because maybe I only had one book written by somebody who revealed a few things and somebody could dismiss the book. But now there's so much information coming from so many different points of view, you know, and different sources and resources, sometimes not connected with each other, that it's impossible to dismiss it. Like we're saying about this flag, whose flag is it really? Right. Whose flag is it really? And this is not saying that whether the state of Israel or whoever, you know, who sees this as an important symbol, but don't deny those who was using it and upholding it. And basically, from the oldest reference that we can show you, let me show you right here. We show you this right here. Let's just go right here and let's go all the way to the top. Let's go over here. Let's go all the way to the, it was the last, it was this picture right here. Now, as you can see, this is the treaty, right? We was talking about at the end of the previous, the other video on Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford. So, I might name this a little differently, like whose flag is this really? Because we addressed this in a couple of videos like as a as a follow up point you know as a point of reference but it's important that we were zooming in on this when the video went off Sion inside the Magen David right or it's called the Star of David right or the Shield of David Magen David you'll see that it says Sion Sion right in the Asherit like the square or some might say even Masoretic Hebrew Sion Right, you see the Sadai, the Yod, right, um, the Wow or the Vav and the Noon, right, Zion. Zion is right there, there, there in the center. And then you see the two stripes, the two stripes that symbolizes that Abrahamic, some call it the Greater Israel Project. You might hear some ones and ones amongst the, you know, um, State of Israel, those who support the State of Israel or the you know, speaking about the greater Israel. Now, if you look in Genesis chapter 15, as we mentioned, what was promised to Abraham and the seed of Abraham of Abraham, the fullness of the promise was from the river of Egypt, which is the root of the river of Egypt is the river of Ethiopia, of Tobia, and the river Euphrates. So those two blue, the two blue lines are for the two rivers, right? The two rivers. But note this right here, that we have this treaty. I want to point to this treaty right here, right? You see the two flags. Now, another point is this, that did you know that before the Balfour Declaration and those particular politics, politics that occurred with the whole Balfour Declaration and the United Nations and everything and the European Jews and their desire to get this Palestine as a state and everything, um, we find this flag here. And they had wanted to go into East Africa, right? Some of the Jews who were looking for Exodus, looking for a homeland, a promised land outside of Europe. They wanted to go into Africa, particularly East Africa. There was Wakanda. They were speaking about Wakanda. I, I kid you not. Or Uganda. It's the same thing. But in Hebrew, sometimes, you know, in our languages, some things can be said in, you know, two different ways. Like Uganda. The wow, the vav, the wow, more correctly. Also, Wakanda, Wakanda, Uganda, 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 Wakanda, right? Uganda, Wakanda. They wanted to have some place in Uganda and other areas as well. This is all historical fact, documented fact. You can look it up, right? And some very interesting books that we can recommend, you know, written by some of the um, truth telling, we we'll say, European Jews you know, concerning some of these same facts right here, just plain and simple facts. So this treaty here between the Lion of Judah, 
Now, really, more fully, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Moa and Bessa, Zaim Negeda, Yehuda, right? The king of Ethiopia and the United States, we have His Majesty, right? Minulik II, Dagmawi Minulik, Negusa Negesa, Ethiopia, to regulate commercial relations. Now, as I mentioned previously, just to mention here for the record, what prompted this right here was Afro-Americans, many of our black resurrected people, people who were beginning to connect the dots because of time, right? That time had come, right? That time for Yahweh to show mercy to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, we the black and brown people, the beta Israel, right, of the West, right? So this we have signed at Addis Ababa, December 27th, 1903. It says ratification, right, advised by the Senate, March 12th, 1904, right? It says, um, what is it right here? Ratified by the president, right, March 17th, 1904, right? And it says the king of Ethiopia notified of ratification in August 2nd, 1904. Now, look at the difference in the months, from March to August, because you have to remember, they didn't have social media. Like, you can just, like, send a text, you know, or I email it to you. You know, you know, I had to go by a ship. So the Afro-American, that black delegation, there was a black delegation. I think they left from Harlem, but black delegation, right, of our people over here, right, you say abroad in diaspora, Ethiopian Hebrews in diaspora had made this pilgrimage to the occupant upon the throne of King David, right, in that biblical land known as Ethiopia, right? So that link with what our people were doing, right, for our salvation, right? It says, saviors shall come up, right, to Mount Zion, Zion, and shall judge the Mount of Esau. It's all part of, this is all part and parcel, right? Um, proclaimed, it was proclaimed September 30th, 1904, by the presence of the president of the United States of America, a proclamation. Let me just share the proclamation right here. It says, whereas a treaty of commerce between the United States of America and his majesty, Menelik II, King of Kings of Ethiopia, was concluded on the 27th day of December, 1903. So in 19, right, in 1903. The original of which treaty being in the Amharic and French languages, right? So the original of this treaty being in the Amharic and French languages is word for word as follows. So here, 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 just to show this right here, right? And here it says flyer originally captioned, originally was captioned propaganda literature used by Abyssinians, quote unquote in recruiting followers. You know, like they love, you know, you tell them, I'm no nigger, I'm no Negro, I'm Ethiopian, and still they turn around and say, yeah, nigger, whatever nigger. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not Abyssinian, I'm not Habasha, I'm, I'm Ethiopia, Ethiopian, right? They say, okay, okay, whatever Habasha, whatever Abyssinian, right? But they're saying that the original of this flyer was uh, originally my caption propaganda literature used by Abyssinians in recruiting followers. But note the quote and quote around Abyssinians. As his majesty said, this country is called Ethiopia, not Abyssinia. That's a outside, that's like somebody calling you nigger, a Negro, and you saying, no, I'm black, American, I'm African American, I'm whatever, whatever you want to say. Right? And they still calling you a byword. And this say in the Negro the Negro in Chicago, a study of race relations and a race riot by the Chicago Commission on Race Relations, Chicago University of Chicago Press, 1922. All right. So here we get in historical. This is all historic. Wow. 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 I almost missed that, brothers and sisters. Did you catch that? All right. Did you catch that? All right. 1922. What's the year right here? The year right here is 2022. All right, so what is that? That's 100 years, all right, 100 years later. So hopefully this will be a revelation for ones and ones, 100 years later. So this is one reason why when we have um, flew this flag, people say, oh, you're flying the State of Israel flag. Well, bef before it was the State of Israel, right, here it was the treaty flag, 
right, between the king of kings of Ethiopia upon the throne of great King David, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, right? Because the tribe, remember, we're of a tribe. Not just a religion. It didn't say the lion of the tribe of Judaism, right? But the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we see the Ethiopian flag, what appears to be the Ethiopian flag, and what appears from the modern day confusion, right, to be the state of Israel flag. But let's just state something right here. Right? Before it became or before it was appropriated or in some term misappropriated by the state of Israel right, and the Eastern European Jews, right, the Beta Israel, the black Jews of the West, along with their brethren, <laughs> right, their covenant-keeping brethren, right, especially those of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Israelites of Ethiopia, this was their flag, and this is our flag, and this is from 19 what? 1903, 1903. Just to point this out, this is very, very important. So when we ask, so, you know, some are still going to speak ignorantly because they either don't know, willingly, right, or just, they just are ignorant, not knowing, and when they get to know, they'll be speaking the right thing. Hopefully, now that some of y'all are getting to know this, y'all can check this out for yourself, follow up on this, and recognize that this too was our flag. So when we talk about things being stolen from us or taken from us, like we create music, right? They don't just call it black music, right? Or black American music. They say it's everybody's thing. You know, but everybody else do things and it's things for their people, for who they are. But we do things, it becomes everybody thing. You see, that is still part of the consequences, right, of um, what they call the curses for disobedience, the consequences for disobedience. It's like the residual. It's like the residual, like in the matrix. It's like the residue, the residual, right? So we have to clean here in the season. And here, the season that we're in currently as of this record is coming from the seventh to the eighth day, right, of Pesach, of Passover, and to the Shabbat day, that is the earth day, the birthday of our first, we say, black rabbi, right, one of the resurrected among the Yehudim, the Judahites here in this north country, in the wilderness of North America, Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford, here we commemorate the 145th anniversary of his birth, right, and still going to touch a little bit more on Josiah, right? But here, and now, let me say this right here, that even though this is a historical document, there's still much in this that is actionable. Point this out to the um, to those of I and I who studied law and putting this into action. You know what I mean? That although this is a historical document, some things are strictly historical. Right? But this being a historical document and seeing that our ancestors and our people right, had a role and a responsibility and their hands is involved. So this is not just something that the United States government just decided, oh, we're going to just do this. We're going to have commercial treaty. No, it's because once the black people, we, the black people of the world, started to make that link with Ethiopia, then... You know, America said, you know, <laughs> what's the old saying? If you can't beat them, join them, right? Right. So let's put things in perspective. This flag that's called the Israeli, the state of Israel flag was first being flown, right, by we, the black people of the world, we, the black Jews of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's why we say that we, the black Jews, because when you say Jews, it could refer to to just a religious thing among some, but for us, it's of the tribe of Yehuda, of the tribe of Judah. So let's discuss, let's reason on how is this still actionable, right? How is this still actionable? The first thing that we have to act on is to acknowledge, you know, to acknowledge this as a fact. Of course, a lot of folks are going to try to dismiss this, Right? Because this kind of is like a the stone that's not cut by human hands, you know, flying out of the, the mountain. You know what I mean? And licking somebody upside the head like Dawit throwing the stone against Goliath. You know what I'm saying? But as it says in Obadiah, right? It says, well, that saviors, right? Saviors <laughs> shall come up upon Mount Sion, right? right? Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom and the kingdom and the government. 
All right, so the first thing we need to do is to know who we be. So just to go into this a little bit more here and to show this. So this evidence, right? And then if we, we have it, but we're not going to get into that right here. Y'all can do this because some will say, no, that's not so. It's the, it's the European Jews. It belongs to them. Just like jazz, right? Just like jazz, right? You want to talk about jazz? It's not saying that some of other peoples, of other nations, nationality, don't do things that we might have created or, I can say, given birth to or brought into reality, into manifestation. Some of them do it as well, and some of them might even do it in some ways better, right? But nobody does it better, right? Some may do it even very good. You know what I'm saying? Can't say white man can jump. Some of them can jump. You know what I mean? Not a Larry Bird fan, but, you know, he could play ball. You know what I'm saying? Nothing wrong with that. But when one want to then kind of take our proprietary interests, <laughs> you know what I mean? When we understand what property is in Ha Torah, right? Then we have to get up and stand up. But first thing, we have to become informed. So right here, whose flag is this really? This is the flag, right, of, the, of us. This is our flag, as, as well as the line of the tribe of Judah flag. Because this whole treaty between the United States of America right and the king of kings of ethiopia the lion of the tribe of judah right was initiated was birthed off of the doing of our people and our people right had a strong hand and a role in this it was basically us seeking to find out our roots right and then when we find our roots right other people find something of use or just involve themselves as america did but Nevertheless, this still could have been very, very profitable. Now, when you start to understand, well, if this is true, and it is true, all right, trust me, but go find the truth for yourself, right? If this is true, and it is true, then what does that tell you about the so-called reality that you've been made to believe, right? And the real order of things, how things really happen and then how you make believe or how you've been made to believe, right? Make, make be like Eve, right? Like Eve was belied in the garden, right? And then he got cast out, right? So one's cast themselves out, say that this has nothing to do with us. This has everything to do with us. So this would even explain from the 1900s, this explains to I and I, the reason why America finally allowed European immigrants to come in from other parts of Europe that were not necessarily Anglo, Anglo, right? Anglo Europeans. They know they were not from England and they were not necessarily Protestants. You have to recognize that America for a long time, right, only really accepted gladly immigrants, right, from England or other parts of Europe who were either Anglo, you know, European or who were Protestants, preferably both. But then at the turn of the 20th century, the 1900s, that is, you see them open up the floodgates. You know, you know, what I'm talking about Ellis, you know, Ellis, you know, Ellis Allen. Yeah, Ellis Allen. What do you think Ellis Allen was for? Because they've done this. It's just, it's, just, it's just simple politics or politics, if you want to call it that. Right? There is such a thing called politics. We have to be involved in the policies that better our people, our community. But this was part of the politics there. They've done this before. Right? Like when they brought over the Irish. The Irish who many Irish have said they were treated like N-words. Right? Many of the Irish, they were treated like N-words. And we know that we have roots there as well. <laughs> you know, we're treated like N-words. You know, the black Irish. You, you know anything about the black Irish? Yeah, some of them were actually deported to the Caribbean. I know we begin to think that the Patois and some of the Jamaican and, and, and Caribbean dialects, you know, and it, it, we figured it's just because of the couple of white people that were in the island right, who were the governor general. No, no, it goes deeper than that. Many of us came from w West continent, the West of the continent called today Africa, but many of our people also came out of Europe. See, this is what they want to, they don't want to, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Come on now, come on now, you know what I mean? And even if Africa, the continent is the best, you know, piece of real estate on the face of the earth, 
there's still a lot of good real estate on the face of the earth. And I go with what the word says, right? The earth is Jehovah's and all of her fullness, right? So our people were everywhere, man. As J.A. Rogers even said, wherever water touches land, he said, you'll find Ethiopians there. That was a way of saying you'll find black people in a honorable and positive sense. <laughs> they are, right? So here, here, here. You know, just just want to show you this right here again, you know, just to keep this front and center right here. Right. This is very much front and center. Right. So this here explains a whole lot. I just point to the Ellis Island thing. You have to think about it. Why? Did, when they brought up the people from Ellis Island. Right. When was the first Ellis Island? Sometime after after this, around the same time. Right, they done this before. Like remember the riots, the 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 Harlem, what they called it again. Um, there was a whole movie about like the riots of New York, the street gangs. Yeah, the street gangs. Some of the street gangs in New York. Some of y'all seen some of that, and some of that addresses, you know, one persecuted group of people. Some of the white peoples. And, well, they they wasn't white people at first. Later on, when they came to America, they became more white because the racism, white supremacy was more... Like even Hitler said he learned a lot about his racism from watching America and everything. He thanked America greatly. That's why, you know, it's amazing that history kind of, you know, seemed to go this way at one moment. And then all of a sudden, you know, like somebody thinks that they, they, they stole something, they ran away with it, and then they drop it out of their hand. They don't even know. They keep running and running. You know, and you pick it up and go your way. By the time they get where they're going, they find out that, oh, man, you know, it's like um, somebody that a hungry man is dreaming that he has food and he wakes up and, and, and he is starving. You know what I mean? So we right, <laughs> don't need to be dreaming about food. We need to see the vision. Right. So that vision to reality. So here, 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 brothers and sisters, once again, this particular flag. And like I said, they explain a whole lot. They brought the Irish over. Right. And they pit the Irish and pit many people. Right. And this transcends just the white and black dynamic of it. You know, the white and black dynamic. See, we recognize this. We as black people who very much would champion, you know, our people, you know, first. Because this is our people, right? Our family, right? I do, you know, charity at home, right? Better than charity abroad. We still understand, you know, the psychology, right, of the satanic attack. You got to understand the psychology of this, right? So they brought in these other peoples from Europe that they would not have over here for the hundreds of years before, right? Then they bring them over, and then they bring them over into neighborhoods and areas, right, where black peoples were coming to from down south, right, were coming to from the plantation states and other areas, were coming to from the Caribbean, right, were coming to from Mexico. I mean, Mexico even back then was more Negro was black, was more nig overtly, all right? So, enough of that right there, brothers and sisters, just on this right here, 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 right? On this right here, here, here. Let's just come out of this for a moment. Let's just share some of this right here just with you on the outro. So, this book right here, all right? That's one of the best versions of the picture, all right? In this book here, we're going to seek to get a copy of this too. Black Land, Imperial Ethiopia. Ethiopianism. Actually, Ethiopianism, that whole idea was something that was birthed by black America, by black Americans. We, yes, we do prefer the terminology black American than African American. Any question about it? We'll try to do a vlog on it, you know, just to explain, right? Because when we use the terminology, historically speaking, we find more in our favor, right? as black American and a lot of our struggle of our people was identifying ourselves as black American. And it's almost as soon as we got some victory on that, somebody came along and switcheroo the name. Some people blame Jesse Jackson for that. He does have a role to play in that. We can understand what some of those boules were thinking, but then again, a boule is to advise a king. 
and they were not speaking about the king of kings. So therefore, it was Caesar. <laughs> so they were doing Caesar's bidding. Right? But the idea of Ethiopianism or that which pertains to Ethiopia, this is an idea that actually was birthed over here in the West. But the interesting thing about it is that it so inspired many of our brothers and sisters in the East right, that they also went into their archives, so to speak, right, and went to their hearts and minds and also raised that, it was like a meeting, you know, of East and West. So the treaty that we just showed you is a powerful document. Mm -hmm. That's something that we should have, or the generation before, should have continued to build on. Some attempted to, but we got swerved, right, over here, especially with World War I. Remember World War I? Well, you don't remember, but there was World War I, there was a crash of the stock market, there was the Lateran Treaty, there was a healing of the Delhi Wound of the Beast, there was looking to the east, the, the, the kinging of Rastafari, and then the King of Kings, the throne of David, 72 nations, recognized that prophetic event, right? Then the fascists, the Romanists, the counterfeit Christian, the anti-Christians attack true Judeo-Christians, Right in that fascist war and invasion of Ethiopia, 36, around that time, 1936. It's interesting because I saw something concerning Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford that said that he passed away in 1935. And there were others who had immigrated or made Aliyah, had returned to, to the land, east of the River Nile, to the Promised Land. But many of them were deported by Mussolini, right? after the fascist attack and invasion he he wanted to get out the the black american and those black people especially over here in the west right because he knew that we more than even some, some of the africans right you know in africa understood especially the black people of that generation the the, the early 20s and 30s and you know those days right divide and conquer basically but this book here that's one of the books right here here's another book too um ethiopia the land of promise a book of purpose this is 1917 right by clayton adams right and then you see this right here this is not the best picture of it apologies it's from chicago defender you know chicago new york right these were some places especially chicago has a lot of history new york does too in this regard, right, with um, Ethiopian Hebrews and Beta Israel and we Israelites. But the Chicago Defender, Civilians Battle, 10th Calvary. Then it says right here, Abyssinian Mission arrives in U.S. Note that even though the people declare themselves that this is our name, they like to go back to this Abyssinian thing. And then you got some kooky black folks, I think, by picking that up. Right, you know, even some careless Ethiopians, the Habasha thing, Habasha. But we'll touch on that hopefully another time. Then the riots, there was the riots, and about the riots, some interesting pages too. We'd like to share some research pages. Here we have um, Reverend, we have Reverend um, James Morris Webb, James Morris Jacob, we call him Jacob, James Morris Webb, right? Negro Universal king coming to rule the world. So many people credit Marcus and Sai Garvey with the prophecy. But from our research and from the evidence, we see that it was actually this black American Reverend, Reverend James Morris Webb that was the first proclaimer. And when Garvey came forward to this country, to America, to the wilderness of North America, he met a lot of proactive black people here. More so by measure, of course, more up here than in Jamaica, than in the Caribbean. But this was able to really give a groundation to the vision right, that he had and to the work and the purpose. After all, what does the prophecy say? A voice crying in the wilderness, shouting out in the wilderness. Right? Prepare, prepare, prepare. Right? So here, I'd like to show this right here, right? just so you can maybe pause it and read it for yourself if possible. Right. Well, let's just read a little bit of this right here. It says the Kaiser and Napoleon failed in war to be universal kings. This is all by Reverend James Morris Webb, who was the first proclaimer of look to Africa where black men will be crowned king. 
in him you will find the redeemer. Word of prophecy on this? There's the kinsman redeemer, right? The kinsman redeemer, right? And the kinsman redeemer and the connection of the king, even the king of kings, and this man born there, Ethiopia, Psalm 87, verse 4, princes coming out of Egypt. That's us out of this Western Gentile Babylon, Egypt. You know what I mean? Ethiopia stretched forth her hands to God, all speaking about that event horizon of the 20th century, especially the early 1900s. So here, Reverend Webb says, the Kaiser Napoleon failed in war to be universal kings. That the real purpose of the Kaiser of Germany, Khazar, the Khazar, Kaiser, Caesar, Caesar, Khazar, Kaiser, you get it? The Kaiser and Napoleon failed in war to be universal kings. The coming Negro king will not fail. The Negro king. I want to emphasize that for the one Westers and the other Latter-day 70, 1970 AD Israelites. Right? A reference book to the Bible sells, tells the facts, tells the facts and a picture of this king. Well, I think it was $2 for both. Wow. You know, price differences, right? Negro characters in the Bible. Four um, pictorial, right, in two forms. Number one, Negro King Solomon and Colored Queen of Sheba. <laughs> Colored Queen of Sheba. And also King Solomon's Temple, right? Number two, the Negro King Tut, and his treasures. Isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters, how a lot of the modern Egyptians who are the result of nine different nations that molested, groped, and even raped ancient Egypt, you know what I mean, who say that they are the very descendants of ancient, you know, how they do this thing with King Tut. You all seen this crazy King Tut thing that looks nothing like any of the visual art and facts that the ancient Egyptians left for us and all humanity to see what King Tut looked like. But they said, no, this is what he actually looked like, you know, but here's interesting, the Negro King Tut and his treasures, right? The price for all was $1. Wow. $1. Agents wanted, right? By sending $1.50 for outfit agents, right? People say, oh, the agent, you see agent, don't be silly. Right, we all represent something or someone. Right, what do you represent? Who are you an agent of? We are agents of the King of Kings. He said, Write to Reverend James M. Webb. Right, and this was his address and money order registered mail, Seattle, Washington. This right here, also interesting Abyssinians, man accused of killing two during flag burning parade, and man who identified him. You know, some interesting Abyssinian news. Right, this is Grover Cleveland Redding, right, secretary of the Star Order of Ethiopia. <laughs> he was a secretary of the Star Order of Ethiopia. See, here's a question we have to ask. With this identification of Ethiopia, right, at home and abroad, what happened to it? What happened to it over these 70 or so years, right? Especially like from 1930 till we come to this new millennia, to September 11th. Did you know September 11th is Ethiopia's New Year Day? You didn't know that. Makes you think about it, right? Then also this right here, the OAAU. Still have a video on the OAAU to share. You know, where did Malcolm X get the idea from, right? The OAAU, right? And also maybe some reasoning on why most attempts to do it has failed. And also why it failed. Where Malcolm X, Malik Al-Hajj Al-Shabazz, where he went wrong with this. And we do know because remember that the origin of this comes from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And he was there. That's where he got the idea from. Right? But they had told him to wait. Right? And he was too eager to get back to America and get back in the fray. But let's go forward right here. So here, 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 let's come out of this. All right, I think we're at a fullness of an hour right here. All right, the, the rider, all right? Yeah, the King of Kings, all right? Okay, deaths and war, okay, just a couple of other ones right here. Will Europe answer? 
the emperor's plea, the king of kings plea before it perishes. Look at that title there. Will Europe answer? Now, Europe, remember, his majesty went to the League of Nations. The League of Nations is none other than, biblically, the League of Gentiles. Ethiopia not conquered. Right? And then has quotation marks Mussolini. Right will prevail. Save Ethiopia, right will prevail. This is from the organ of the organization, the newspaper from back in the 30s, the voice of Ethiopia. It is better to die free than live in slavery. All right, slavery. I say it that way so you can get the idea of the Slavs, so you can understand what's really behind what was the malice of forethought amongst the racist Gentiles. All right, this was volume two. Right, I think it's number 35. It was from Saturday, September 24th, 1938. Yeah, 1938. It was five cents everywhere. But look at the title right there. Will Europe answer the emperors, or Negus and Negus, the king of kings, plea before it perishes? The emperor of Ethiopia, literally in them hark, Negus and Negus is king of kings. I emphasize that because then it helps to put the prophecy and history and the reality together. The king of kings of Ethiopia and his prophecy. Uh-oh. Mm. Did you know there was a prophecy? And this prophecy, when first prophesied, was laughed off. Did you know? It was first laughed off. But then about five or so years, right, after the fact, the announcement of the fact, the prophetic fact, pathetically, Ones recognized the fact was right and accurate, right? But here, 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 the prophecy where the, the match you struck, right, in Ethiopia, the, the flames will burn, right, will burn Europe, right? So here, 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 Ethiopian World Federation, right, incorporated right here. Mussolini admits Ethiopia not conquered, right? Ethiopian foreign minister dead. 254 wounded Italian officers from Ethiopia. All right, so this was a major, major, right, major reporting, right, to get the real half of the story, because a lot of people talk about what occurred, right, and who's who and what's what, but this is the voice, this is the voice of Ethiopia, right, and this also shows that that joining, right, of the, are you not as the children of the Ethiopian and the male children of Israel as well, right here, here, here. Right, the League of Gentiles, the League of Nations, is Madsy prophesizing to them. He pleading the cause, right, of the Israelites of Ethiopia and of all Ethiopians, of all people, right, of humanity, the Son of Man. So you see the Son of Man prophecy right here, right, the Son of Man, right, testifying to the true power of the Bnei Elohim, right. So right here, 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 just a couple other news related. There's a tin pot Caesar. Right, the Kaiser, Kaiser Mussolini, right, and here's these three dirty, these three dirty spirits. <laughs> Remember, it says like three dirty spirits, like a f frogs, right? Because ones don't even recognize that there's a prophecy about the deadly wound of the beast, right? Went on at that very time in 1920. What was it? 1920. What was it, 26, no, 27, 27, 28, 1928 and 1928. We're going to do another vlog on that. But these are the ones, Woodrow Wilson, right, false prophet. He talked about peace in our, not, he's a normal peace in our time. But, you know, he was promoting the League of Nations, right, in such a way, right? But the true prophet, right, the one who gave the true prophecy was Ketamah, we had a Salasi, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Then we have the beast here, right, the beast, right, according to this, right, we have Pius, Pope Pius the 11th, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, you know, when Passover we cleanse out, burn out the leaven, right, 11, 11, right, his papacy ended in 1939, right, not a moment too soon. Then you had El Dunce, right, El Duce, El Dunce, Benito Mussolini, right, um, Tin Pot Caesar, my right? Prime Minister of Italy. He was in office up until from 22 to 2. You get that right there? Notice 1930. No, he was in office. Mussolini got in office. I don't know if any of us had made a point about this. On Halloween, on Halloween, he got in office 
on Halloween 1922. Now, we just touched on 22, 1922, right? And the others still speaking about the treaty, right? East and West, right? Ethiopian Hebrews at home and abroad. Now, we have Mussolini becoming prime minister in 1922 on the 31st of October. And then he got out of office or was hung by the 25th of July, 1943. Right, and he served his monarch, his king, his Roman king, Victor Emmanuel the Third, right, in the Armageddon, right, the Hard Megiddo, right, the Armageddon, right, also the heal up, you know, um, yeah, got to heal up John C. Robinson right here, 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 and our Black American ancestors, right, and those from here in the West, in the Americas, and the Caribbean. Right, their support, they even going forward over there, and even to those who wanted to go but was not able to go. All right, let's just zoom in on this right here just to give one a fuller full of this right here, here, here. One of the latest pictures out of Addis Ababa of John of Colonel John C. Robinson, head of the Royal Ethiopian Air Force. So a black American fighter pilot, the head of the Ras, the Rosh, the head of the Royal Ethiopian Air Force, who, after direct orders from Emperor Haile Selassie, is to lead a squadron of special bombing planes in an assault on certain mountains, which are to be blasted in the campaign of Ethiopia to halt the advance of Italians in Addis Ababa. Military experts gasp at the audacity of the plan, many calling it as strategic and feasible a maneuver as was the trick Hannibal of Carthage played on the ancient Romans by, by what does it say right there? By lining the hills with oxen, carrying light torches, lighted torches. The Roman history relates followed, followed the oxen thereby leaving themselves open to a Carthaginian attack. Haile Selassie, who has sworn to die before surrendering to the Italians, decided to blow up the mountains as a last resort to save his kingdom. Interesting. All right, very, very interesting right there, there, there. Here, just to see this here, we're going to seal this up right here. All right, um, so we can see what we had, what we lost, and what we can regain again, right, in spirit and in truth. So here, 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 I need to get our cocky uniforms. Yeah, I'm not only emperor, king of kings of Africa. I am king of all Negroes everywhere, including those in the United States. Haile Selassie first, Chicago Defender, June 15, 1935. Now, some try to say, well, he didn't really say this. It seems as though it was a translation, but a translation from what we have seen from the actual article this is accurate, yes, right? Let's do a video on it, right? So right here, 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 this is, um, okay, this is the author of the Holy Pibby, right? Um, fatal ending of the Abyssinian Parade, right? Now, this is what we were talking about before. Let's just see if we can see what this was about right here. I know this is a little outside of the subject matter, but this photograph of the Abyssinian delegation to the United States was taken in New York. It shows um, Dr. Jonas said by the police to be the instigator among the Negroes and, and two, the second person, Grover C. Redding, who on horseback, let's see what it says, who on horseback led the parade. All right, so there is Dr. Jones. Right? Oh, they, they have a quotation mark around doctor, right? And then the brother in the background. There's some fatal parade or something like that here. Here it says, Captain Thomas Callahan, Callahan at left and Detective Sergeant William Middleton. Okay, uh, Middleton is the one on the right hand, the black guy, right? Displaying the fantastic garb and the weapons taken in a raid on the Abyssinians. Right, speech made to Negroes before shooting. Wow, so I guess we can't say 
It's just today, huh? Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. This is what we start to get to. We're right here, the commercial relations right here, right? This is just a part of part of it. By the President of the United States of America, proclamation, whereas a treaty of commerce, okay, yeah, between the United States of America and His Majesty Menelik II, King of Kings of Ethiopia, was concluded on the 27th day of December, 1903, 1903, the original of which being in the Amharic and French languages is a word for word as follows. Just the first part of it, Treaty of Commerce, it says, His Majesty Menelik II, King of Kings of Ethiopia, and the United States of America, having agreed to regulate the commercial relations between the two countries and develop them and render them more and more advantageous to the two contracting powers. His Majesty Menelik II, King of Kings of Ethiopia, in the name of the empire, and Robert P. Skinner, in the name of the United States of America, have agreed and stipulated that which follows. So we'll go into hopefully a fuller full. This is one of the pics that appeared. As you can see, this was not very clear here, but we can still make out what we can make out right there. Right, and here, 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 right, crowning, right, and here, Arnold Josiah Ford and Mig Mignon, I think Mig Mignon, Mignon or Minion, Minion Ford with the Beth Benai Yisrael congregation. Okay, okay, so this is Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford and his wife in the picture. Right, Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford and his wife. I think there's the two on the right hand side, but um, I might not be correct right there. But here it says they're both in this picture right here, here, here. It seems so. Right, right. Here's Universal Ethiopian Hymnal. So here, 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 brothers and sisters, let's seal up right here. I'm gonna seal up right here in honor once again of our first. Black rabbi, right? Ethiopian Hebrews, part of the resurrection, right? Those who sought to follow the Son of Man, right? In the regeneration, right? In the regeneration. Yes, I. Rastafari. So here, here, here. Let's see if we can just seal it up with this particular pick right here. Um, there was this pick right here. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopian? Yeah, the choice factor. All right, let's just seal that up right there. The choice factor. Amos 9 and 7. Are ye not as the children of Ethiopians to me, or children of Israel? 